Good afternoon, and I hope us all to have a very peaceful and wonderful day of conference. Something that I'm trying to uh, present here today, although this topic would deserve uh, several days of conference, but I will do briefly and touch upon the European Digital Sovereignty Initiative. So it's, it also uh, relates to or, uh, strategic autonomy as a framework. And I would, now I will jump to conclusions by saying that Excite, in its focus, in its content of the work, is very heavily focusing on these very same focus areas. And the key question still is whether the current policy making appreciates and stimulates the curiosity that Ivo referred to, or is it restricting it? Now about dates in the process. So March 2021, exactly a year ago and a couple of more days, uh, the president, four prime ministers turned to the president of the European Commission and they called upon the European Union to speed up the process of developing digital uh, single market and to focus on digital sovereignty. It was a new concept. The digital single market has been heard before, uh, uh, if not for decades. But digital sovereignty was something brand new. So four, four prime ministers, Finland, Denmark, Germany and Estonia. Uh, uh, the president of the commission responded in September in the State of the Union uh, address. That, that he were, so the answer was yes technological and digital sovereignty for the European Union has to happen. And in this speech, um, key ideas were mentioned as well. And the speech also referred to uh, the shortage of chips. But the background goes further back in history for more than a decade. and. For the time being, Europe has made certain choices in implementing new technologies. However, we have less and less choice. More than 90% of the data is stored outside the European Union. The top 20, the global top 20 technology companies, none of them come from Estonia. I'm sorry, from the from Europe. The chips are not, none of them, less than 10% of chips and uh, the, uh, uh, technological supplies are produced in Europe and the market is more and more concentrated and less and less companies hold the power uh, in terms of uh, being the suppliers. Therefore, it's very important to know the situation and to bring the control back to Europe to, in order to gain digital sovereignty. So very briefly, I can sum up that an American approach by Princeton University uh, relates to ICT technologies and infrastructure and also applications. So what would have these would have to be subordinated to national interests uh, national regulation so this is a top down regulatory approach however it would not interfere with the market it only means the strategic aspects of it are covered 
uh, Germans have widened uh, this understanding and they say that it's an important opportunity for the government uh, in order to contribute to the growth of well-being of its citizens by making state-of-the-art technologies available for the citizens. And this is something that we should focus even more and think about what are the ways that we can do R&D activities in order to reduce dependencies. The European digital sovereignty, what would be the threats of fears in Europe but also in the world in general? They are well grounded. The first thing, the first fear is that with digital sovereignty, with strategic autonomy, Europe would isolate, knowingly isolate themselves from the global digital inno innovation and R&D networks and together with all these new rules and regulations we find ourselves isolated. While China on one hand and the US in the other hand uh, are already well ahead of us, so we wouldn't have the competitive edge to compete with them. The other thing that is feared is that digital sovereignty would serve the interests of large countries first and foremost, be it Germany or France, but smaller countries, those who have very open innovation, who are very open to digital uh, solutions to be used would be in a worse situation. So these are real threats and they need to be discussed because in when we say autonomy or sovereignty, we have to consider these um, aspects as well. What's important is to understand what these strategic technologies are. What do we mean by them? Uh, and what is it that we need and how can we get them or deliver them without uh, being overly protective of our markets? In the European Union, it's defined as uh, big data, cloud uh, technologies, chip and quantum technologies and also a few others, like in corp or excite programs all these different areas of research show us. But we also need to understand that these are very complex and difficult and highly integrated systems. They cannot, they don't exist in separate silos. They only add value uh, when they are integrated. And this is globally integrated as well, whether it's financial services, transport, logistics, health services, there's always a global dimension to it. It's highly complex. The European Union approach has usually traditionally been related to uh, regulations, frameworks, so this is classic for the European Union. And that would really set some borders to us if we if we are not able to um, be as curious as we would otherwise be. However, certain preparations are being made at the European level. We already have the GDPR. We are preparing AI regulatory framework we don't know exactly what they will look like exact, uh, in the future once they're ready. And it seems that sometimes governments want to over-regulate things that are non-existent as of yet, instead of attempting to stimulate innovation and um, research. Now, regulation is one thing, stimulus is another. For stimuli, the European Innovation Council, where I also uh, work and where we have various um, 
uh, programs and, uh, and research groups and data centers, uh, as well as control over the data that we are using. These all demand secure internet connection. Europe has so far had examples in strategic autonomy that have been successful. Let's take, for example, the Galileo program, Airbus, the uh, uh, space, European Space Agency, and other pan-European uh, networks that deal with uh, raw materials, strategic raw materials, that is very important to us. Now, coming back to the uh, objective of strategic sovereignty and autonomy, when we think about the ways Europe has so far designed its policies and also implemented its policies, then certainly Estonia will feel the impact. In Estonia, we have um, a draft law that hasn't yet been uh, a strategy, sorry, uh, that has been uh, presented to the Parliament but hasn't been approved yet. It's the strategy 2030 for the digital uh, domain. And it relates to the e-governance first and foremost. And many components relate to our approaches which tried to be technologically uh, neutral. It means that we have looked beyond the European borders and we have strategic uh, dependencies in our value chains, chain, uh, supply chain and components. This certainly also influences everything. The European Commission is trying to uh, initiate a digital ID program which can play into the digital society core components. I would also like to say that the Estonian government does not actually have a technology, technology policy that would uh, feed into the wider context and debates and also digital sovereignty and this despite the fact that our Prime Minister was one of those signing uh, the address to the uh, President of the European Commission. What it will influence in Estonia is the digital society and its development. It will somewhat influence uh, Estonian innovation and research, but not to that degree, because we have already been integrated into the European research, innovation, development programs. So I believe that the logic uh, that we have in Estonia is also well integrated into the European uh, development uh, areas. If we we'll look at the fast-growing companies and areas of research in Estonia, then the choices that they've made have been based on relevance rather than digital sovereignty. So the European market was not necessarily their first option, their first place to look. They rather looked further away. All in all, I find that digital sovereignty, so strategic technological autonomy, can only happen if we actively take part in R&D, policy making, and excite network or center is, is the key for that in Estonia, I think. And it's very likely that excite would at one day and uh, besides R&D and innovation, also uh, look into uh, the policymaking paradigm. Obviously, we cannot promote protectionism 
uh, we can't play ourselves into the corner. We have to be open. We have to be ready to be active, to do strategic cooperation with everybody. So that was my attempt of summing up a topic that is only about to start booming uh, in 15 minutes. Uh, I tried to say things that would deserve more time, but over the next decade, I'd say that this would influence the European digital development most. Thank you. Thank you, Linnar. A couple of questions. The audience has asked one question. When are we going to reach these regulations and stimuli actually? It couldn't be that the digital world has developed so much that you need to come up with new regulations. Yes, I think this is a very good question. The first regulation stimuli package is being developed. So the Commission has started work on it. I don't know whether uh, what they do is enough. They have allocated uh, uh, five to seven billions, uh, billion euros for this uh, project. It is going to solve the most uh, topical questions, I think, or the most urgent questions. I have always been of the opinion that uh, European regulations uh, uh, are born very slowly and they uh, try to include too many aspects. You simply can't regulate everything. Estonian um, approach has been different. Estonian has approach has been based on principles and this is more functional and it can give quicker results and it can uh, react more aptly to real life situations. I have seen how the budget of the European Union has been developed. So, in my opinion, during the uh, two uh, budget periods that I have uh, seen, then half of the uh, budget uh, goes to cows, to food production. The uh, agricultural policy seemed rather outdated some years ago. Uh, there have been um, attempts to, uh, to uh, develop it further or to change it, but now when we see the war in Ukraine, when uh, there is going to be shortage of grain, etc., so what is going to happen to the uh, EU budget so that uh, there will be some investment for the uh, IT budget and still have enough food supplies in uh, Europe. Now, Lina, what could be the uh, real sums so for the uh, seven-year budget now we have one trillion um, euros. How much uh, for IT? So five percent has been allocated to ICT. Not a hundred billion, but fifty billion. ICT uh, are not something separate, something independent, but they are embedded in different fields. Last week, uh, I uh, talked to the leaders of the food cluster of the Estonia of the European Innovation Society, and. Uh, we uh, spoke about uh, the uh, growth of uh, efficiency and this is going to happen thanks to the ICT. But when we speak about proportions, then what is enough is 
something that uh, is uh, equal to what is done in the United States and uh, China. So thank you, Linnar.